Welcome, everyone. It's really nice to see all of you out here tonight. I'm Ev Mead. I'm the director of the Transborder Institute. I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you, but there's a lot of new faces, too. Nice to meet you. On behalf of the Kroc School for Peace Studies, I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to our 18th annual lecture in honor of Sister Sally Fury. Let me tell you just a little bit about Sister Sally and why we do this lecture and why we do it in her name. Sister Sally's been a leader on this campus since she arrived here in 1952. As a provost, a dean, and as a professor, she championed a holistic view of education, which combined aesthetic experience, academic excellence, and community service. And that's something I have to tell you, being pretty new to, U to USD, that's really unique, and you should treasure it. And whether it was between men and women on campus or between the United States and Mexico, Sister Sally championed equality by way of understanding and mutual respect. 20 years ago, she created the Transborder Institute and we're very much in her debt. In Sister Sally's honor tonight, I have the privilege of presenting another tireless advocate for justice and another great teacher. Someone who teaches us that human rights don't stop at borders that they're not just about sound bites, GDP predictions, or electoral politics, and someone else who leads by example. Mary Meg McCarthy is executive director of the National Immigrant Justice Center in Chicago. Mary Meg is a leading human rights lawyer, and she's created the largest network of pro bono immigration attorneys in the country. She's defended immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers in every imaginable scenario, from the most basic immigration issues to complex federal litigation. She's done both individual cases and advocacy on behalf of groups and general policy advocacy as well. She's also focused, I think, on the most vulnerable or paid them special attention. So I'm talking about unaccompanied immigrant children, victims of torture, complicated asylum cases. She's dealt with people who are mentally ill, who've been detained for long periods of time. And she never shies away from cases because the individual isn't a good protagonist. She's defended people who've been accused of, of supporting terrorism. She's been defended people without prejudging their cases because they have something on a criminal record. She always looks at the substance behind the case. For this work, she's gotten a, a huge, huge treasure trove of awards. Let me just take off a couple of them. The Midwest, the Midwest Light of Human Rights Award, the American Bar Association's Sarah T. Hughes Civil Rights Award, and the Pax Christi Teacher of Peace Award. But rather than rehearsing any more of her accolades, I'd like to tell you a brief story that I think captures something about who she is and why the work she does is so important. One day, about 15 years ago, an immigration judge called Mary Meg. He told her he was about to order a woman deported, but something in the case just, just didn't sit right with him. He had a sense that there was more to the story. The woman had told immigration officials that she was Chinese. But the court reporter told the judge that she didn't appear to speak Chinese. She could uh, uh, say a couple of words and phrases, but she didn't appear to understand when people were talking to her. Um, and she just kind of nodded her head. But the court reporter said something else, and this really clued the judge in. He said she's afraid. And look, any of us, you know, standing in a courtroom, much less facing deportation, could be afraid. But this was, this was something deeper. It was a kind of terror that flickered in her. It was the terror of someone who expected the worst of humanity. Mary Meg assembled a team of lawyers, social workers, and language interpreters, and they sat down with a woman in a conference room one evening after the office had emptied out. I remember I was there, it was dead quiet in the office, and they were all in this little conference room at the front. And Mary Meg began deliberately and slowly. And the first thing she said to this woman, and, and she did this through a Khmer translator. This is the first time we actually had the, someone who spoke the right language. And it was just a guess, by the way. When you don't understand the language, it's hard to find a language translator for it, right? Um, and she told her, she said, you're safe. We're here to protect you. And the woman must have believed her because suddenly the dam broke. The woman cried out that she wasn't Chinese, that she'd only said so because that's what the other refugees told her to say. And, and she'd kept up this fiction for over a year with dozens of officials because she didn't think anyone would believe her. She didn't think it, her story was worth telling. She was Cambodian, as it turns out. She was born in a refugee camp in Thailand. One of her parents had died and she'd been sold into slavery. 
first to one man who raped and beat her, and then to another and another. And she eventually ended up with a, a man who was Chinese, and that's where she learned the Chinese phrases. This, I, I won't even go th take you through the horrors that she suffered and that she escaped before she came to the United States, but this was her real story. And it tumbled out of her in a flood of tears. For me and for everybody who was there, this was a moment of pure, unvarnished, unfootnoted truth. Nobody doubted her credibility. But the story didn't end there. That's where it began. Uh, translating that story into legal protection was n no, it, not only was it no mean feat, but it was an extreme challenge. If you think about the details of the case, this woman was essentially a stateless person, and she was fleeing persecution from non-state actors, and despite her really compelling testimony, the actual evidence we could present in, in, in a court of law was very fragmentary, and it was very hard to put together. It took a collaborative effort involving experts and volunteers in multiple fields to reconstruct this life history, to explain it in legal terms. And in the end, Mary Megan and her team prevailed. The woman got asylum, and she's now a hairdresser in Chicago, and she lives her life with a modicum of dignity. The legal and management skills Mary Meg showcased here are really important. And we, you know, she, the woman wouldn't have gotten asylum without that. But the thing that made it possible, that created the space for those skills to operate, is more about crafting a career and living a life with a clarity of purpose to which other people will refer in moments of doubt, crisis, and in which they'll place their trust. That, to me, was the real lesson of the story. To be a person of such personal and professional integrity that a judge whose decision she regularly appealed would trust her with this case. To be a person of such humility and understanding that a woman who had no reason to place her trust in another human being ever again would place her trust and indeed her life in her hands. That, my friends, meets my definition of a hero. Most of us, if we're lucky in life, get to meet some of our heroes. Um, I've had the privilege of working very closely with one of mine for 15 years now, and I'm very, very pleased to introduce her to you, Mary Meg McCarthy. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Ev, um, and thank all of you for joining me here this evening. And I really appreciate um, the invitation by the Transborder Institute. And it's very special to have some old friends here from 20 years ago, Diane and Rod Dammeyer. Um, they've been with me in this very long journey. And as Diane was saying earlier, she's like, I didn't even really care about the immigration issue. My concern was homelessness. And then I heard and learned so much about this. And so it's, it's just wonderful to be here. Um, and to come full circle to talk to you about what the work we are doing and the issues we're seeing as the Transborder Institute launches in this new initiative and new endeavor under Ev's leadership. The last time I was here was in 1986 when I came to visit my sister Maureen McCarthy. It was her senior year at USD and I stayed with her at her beach apartment. What was I thinking going to school in the Midwest? <laughs> she is now married with five children and is a woman of great faith and commitment to justice. And now I have an amazing colleague, Ev Mead, your director of the Transporter Institute, who kindly invited me here and will make the Institute even stronger. I've always been impressed with USD's commitment to help students find different kinds of success in their lives that are more about service than salary. I think that the Transborder Institute and the Joan B. Kroc School of Peace Studies exemplify this commitment, and I'm grateful to be here with you today. I'm particularly honored to be delivering the 18th annual Sally Furry Lecture in honor of the Transborder Institute's founder, Sister Sally Furry. Sister Sally created this institute because she knew that human rights transcend the border despite anxieties and prejudices that prevail. She knew that real justice requires dialogue and cooperation. 
And now more than ever, the Institute plays a critical role in promoting justice on both sides of the border. In the spirit of Sister Sally's efforts and energy, I want to share briefly the work of two religious women in Chicago, Sisters Joanne Persh and Pat Murphy, two Sisters of Mercy in their 80s, who have been at the forefront of advancing human rights protections for immigrants, particularly detained immigrants. In Chicago, we work closely with Sister Pat and Sister Joanne, who make weekly visits to immigrants whom the federal government detains in county jails. Sister Joanne and Pat contact NIJC to provide legal representation, and they inform the detainees' families of the whereabouts of their loved ones. Every Friday morning at dawn, rain, snow, or shine, these women and their ecumenical colleagues travel to the Department of Homeland Security Processing Center outside of Chicago, where they pray with the men and women who are being deported that day and comfort their families. But their ministry doesn't just provide solace and assistance to individual families. They advocate for systemic reform, and they were instrumental in the passage of state laws that allow for pastoral visits to detained immigrants in county jails. I'm in, I am honored to be in the presence of Sister Sally and to deliver this annual lecture, which recognizes her leadership. Thank you, Sister Sally. To begin, I would like to share a little about my life journey and how I use my professional skills to confront justice. While studying at the University of Notre Dame, I co-founded the Center for Social Concerns with a group of other students. We saw injustices all around us, from the groundskeepers on the campus who weren't paid enough to support a family, to the extreme urban poverty we witnessed in our summer internships, to the murder of school teachers and priests in Central America's civil wars. The idea was to link community service with experiential learning, so that we were educating ourselves not just to be well-rounded or to get good jobs, but to make positive change in the world, to connect our faith with action. After graduating from college, I joined the Holy Cross Associates and volunteered in Santiago, Chile for two years. I experienced the Pinochet dictatorship firsthand, and it changed my life forever. I was working with students in poor urban schools that the regime had largely, largely abandoned. Their parents had grown up in a democratic society. When they realized that their children weren't getting nearly the quality of education that they had received, they organized and spoke up. The official response was swift and merciless. Community organizers were arrested, tortured, and murdered. Friends and colleagues disappeared on the way home from meetings we had attended together. The people that I knew well eventually turned up, but only after they had been kidnapped, tortured, and threatened. And they had no outlet for their stories, no justice on which to appeal. Others were less fortunate. I also witnessed true heroism. The violent repression shocked the conscience of Cardinal Raul Silva Enriquez, who began his career as a prime example of a wealthy conservative and aristocratic Catholic hierarchy in Chile. Cardinal Silva's vicariate of solidarity visited political prisoners in jail and detention centers, reconnecting them with their families and documenting their experiences, which made it more difficult for the regime to disappear them or hide its own brutality from the world. I thought a lot about the meaning of democracy in those days, not just in the sense of having a right to vote, but being able to speak freely, to demand fair wages, to form a union, and to, res and to resist being relegated to abysmal poverty in the name of someone else's progress. At a more basic level, 
I remember how people lived in fear and how those who questioned the dictatorship were labeled terrorists outside of the law. When I returned to the United States, I taught high school in the inner city of Chicago and saw the harsh reality of gangs and the deteriorating, deteriorating relationship between the police and our communities. I decided to pursue a law degree thinking that I'd be able to use the law as a tool for positive social change. I worked in a law firm and practiced civil litigation while volunteering on the side as, a, as an attorney for the organization I currently lead. Being a lawyer was exciting. I felt like I had my finger in the pulse of all kinds of important things. I had great mentors and worked with smart people. But when the polish wore off, I found it increasingly difficult to see the broader meaning in most of what I did. The last straw for me was a hotly contested lawsuit. After working on the case for months, giving up weekends, holidays, I realized one day that it literally boiled down to moving funds from one floor of an insurance company to another. That was it. I was done. My volunteer work with the National Immigrant Justice Center, at that time known as the Midwest Immigrant Rights Center, had shown me ways of using the law to bring justice to the poor and the marginalized and to connect the struggle against injustice abroad with similar struggles here at home. In 1996, I joined the National Immigrant Justice Center. Since then, we've grown from five attorneys and paralegals to a staff of 40 and from a volunteer crew of several dozen pro bono attorneys to a network of more than 1,500. The nature of the work has changed too. From a community organization providing a lot of general immigration services and coordinating the legal representation of asylum seekers, we've become a national advocate for systemic change through impact litigation in the federal courts, public education, and administrative and legislative advocacy. But NIJC never stopped representing a large number of individual clients. We serve nearly 10,000 individuals annually. It is the core of what we do and truly differentiates us from other immigrant rights or legal service providers because we use what we learn from clients to advocate for systemic change. Serving our clients in their communities is always our number one priority. We've had to expand and become more sophisticated because U.S. immigration policy has, in turn, become a lot more complex, polarizing, and a lot more punitive over the past 15 years. Ordinary non-citizens in the United States accused of violating any aspect of U.S. immigration law have far fewer rights than those accused of the most unspeakable crimes. Every day, hundreds of immigrants are arrested, detained, and deported without probable cause, without seeing the evidence the government may use against them, and without legal counsel. Unaccompanied children, refugees, and all types of immigrants are pressured into waiving their rights without legal counsel and without proper screening. Non-citizens are held for weeks or months at a time, and sometimes longer, in remote county jails subject to arbitrary transfers. If they're lucky enough to hire a lawyer or receive pro bono counsel, their attorneys often have to file and litigate Freedom of Information Act claims just to get a copy of their client's file. Perhaps you're not aware of this, but most immigration hearings are conducted via teleconference, where the detainee appears in a kind of live mugshot on a screen in the judge's chambers. Even if the individual wins relief, the government can appeal, and the attorney general can simply overrule substantive findings by the Board of Immigration Appeals. Justice for immigrants and refugees has become a moving target 
and far too often one that's moving in the wrong direction. For many, the United States is a symbol of justice around the world, and this makes the realities of the immigration system a grand tragedy, something that diminishes American standing in the world. But it also shows us a glimmer of hope that we can change the system by being true to our values. The United States was a global pioneer in the rights revolution of the 18th century, and again in the human rights revolution that followed World War II. The expansive notion of individual liberty and resistance to tyranny articulated in the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights reverberated through constitutional revolutions around the world, even as their full implementation in the United States took generations of struggle against slavery, sexism, and racial discrimination. The same is true of treaty-based instruments, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The US played a funda foundational role even if we haven't always lived up to it in practice. The genius of the American understanding of rights lies in its simplicity and its skepticism of power. Unlike the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen or its Soviet successor, the US Constitution is inherently practical. It creates a system of governance designed to prevent any one individual political party or branch of government for monopolizing power. And it emphasizes what those in power shall not do. The limits of power rather than what they should or must do or what kind of society we should or must create. As a result, when we imagine justice in the United States, we tend to value the fairness of a given process over its outcome. And our constitu constitutional system prizes due process and equality before the law over any particular substantive end or grand vision for society. When the result of due process is the exercise of government power that deprives an individual of her liberty our system demands that such actions be proportional, reasonable, and subject to the scrutiny of a neutral arbitrator. There are three areas of our contemporary immigration system that defy this definition of justice. One, the aggressive enforcement that prioritizes deportation over adjudication. Second, the mandatory detention of immigrants and asylum seekers. And lastly, the failure to recognize basic humanitarian categories. Tonight, I'd like to talk about those three areas with you and walk you through some of the cases that we've seen where there has been a real injustice and where we've tried to address that. In these areas, every day, our government systemically favors specific policy ends over due process and equality before the law and imposes punishments totally disproportionate to the alleged harm done. Our elected officials leave us wondering what justice really means for immigrants and refugees. Rather than talking about the critical history of these three aspects of US immigration policy, which I'm sure my friends at TBI would be happy to provide, I'm going to share the stories of NIJC clients who've experienced the injustices firsthand. They put a human face on the abstractions of immigration politics. More important, their stories offer a unique view and help expose a highly opaque and secretive system. Juan Carlos. Juan Carlos has been in the United States for nine years working in a restaurant. His wife and stepdaughter are US citizens. 
After his car broke down one evening, a police officer stopped to help, but then ticketed Juan Carlos for driving without a valid license. He paid the majority of the fine, but he couldn't afford all of it. He was later stopped by local police for not having a headlight on his bicycle helmet. Since he hadn't paid the entire fine from the prior ticket, local police arrested him and put him in jail for four days. He gathered up some money and went to court to pay the balance. Although this resolved the police matter, local authorities informed Immigration and Customs Enforcement that he was undocumented. Local police transferred Juan Carlos to immigration custody and immigration, custody, I, immigration authorities placed him in removal proceedings. When Juan Carlos went in front of the immigration judge, he did not have an opportunity to explain that he was eligible for relief given his marriage to a U.S. citizen. Today, NIJC represents him, and we will attempt to make his case at his second hearing in the hope of staying in the United States with his family. Juan Carlos has no criminal record aside from these traffic violations. Let me ask you, is this justice? In other words, for driving without a valid license, failing to pay a traffic ticket in a timely fashion, and riding a bike without a helmet light, Juan Carlos fails, faced time in immigration detention, deportation from the United States, and separation from his family for at least 10 years. Some say, wait a second, he was undocumented. That's his fault. Why shouldn't he be deported? Remember, lacking immigration status is not a crime, nor are all undocumented people automatically deportable. In fact, Juan Carlos has a very good case to remain in the United States under current law. But how was he supposed to make that case if he was locked up in a county jail without court-appointed counsel? without seeing the evidence the government has against him, and without being allowed to speak in front of the immigration judge. On a broader level, we have to ask ourselves what the compelling interest is here. What grievous harm justifies the substantial human and financial resources the government dedicates to arresting, detaining, and attempting to deport this man? And what are the suffering this ordeal has imposed on his family and the community? It just doesn't make sense. Sadly, Juan Carlos is not unique. Who is affected by such aggressive enforcement? Immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers? For sure, there are 11 million undocumented people in the United States. But that's only part of the story. A majority of their families have members who are US citizens or who have other immigration status. US immigration laws and policies deny basic legal and human rights to millions of people who live and work in our communities and who are literally members of our families. The failure of Congress to provide a path to citizenship or even simply legal status has created an underclass of residents who are now vulnerable to arbitrary enforcement programs that detain and deport people, often with minimal or no due process. In fact, this is an unknown fact. <laughs> More than 70% of the people deported do not see a judge. In fact, along the border here, people are, what, are issued what's called an expedited removal order. And those comprise 27% of the deportations. Who's caught up in these expedited removal orders? Asylum seekers, children, people who have legitimate claims to remain in the United States, but they are denied that opportunity to see a judge or understand one's rights. 43% of the deportations are due to prior deport orders. They're called reinstatements of removal. 
And for many of those cases, what we have found is that that underlying removal order was issued in error. And then, more than 50% of the criminal prosecutions, federal criminal prosecutions, were related to immigration entry or re-entry violations. Is that justice? Is that what we want our criminal justice system to spend its resources on? Individuals who are crossing the border to be with their children? Let me tell you of another story. After living in the United States with his family, Carlos Guillan, known to his family and friends as Poppy, has spent the past 15 years living isolated and alone in Ecuador. He's missed out on most of his children's life and now has serious health concerns that continue to worsen as he turned 70. In March, Poppy risked his life in a desperate attempt to re-enter the United States to spend his final years with his family. After a harrowing journey through Central America and Mexico, U.S. Border Patrol detained him at an internal checkpoint and incarcerated him in Louisiana. He was ultimately deported. Poppy had worked hard and lived legally in the United States for 30 years. He has deep roots in this country. This administration claims that the Department of Homeland Security only uses his resources to deport individuals who pose a threat to national security or to the community. But in Poppy's case, and in many others, it is clear this is simply not true. The Department of Homeland Security refused to allow Poppy to remain in the United States even after the family filed a claim with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. The basis of Poppy's deportation was his guilty plea to a single drug possession charge 22 years ago. This canceled out the more than 30 years he lived here lawfully, pursuing the American dream, raising a family of US citizens, and working as a delivery driver and salesman. His three children have built successful careers, yet now struggle to support their sick father thousands of miles away. All his family wants is for Poppy to live with dignity and to be together in his final years. Again, we have to ask, is this justice? Is it fair to separate a dying man from his family? Is it in any way proportional to the harm he supposedly caused? Are the considerable resources expended to detain and deport him or the suffering of his family justified? Does it really make us safer? Again, it just doesn't make sense. Poppy's experience is not unique. U.S. interior enforcement has expanded dramatically over the past decade. Under secure communities and other programs, local law enforcement agencies across the country not only report the immigration status of detained individuals to immigration authorities, they have turned virtually all interaction between law enforcement and certain minority groups into opportunities to check citizenship status and to make arrests, warrantless arrests, seize property, and detain individuals. The result, rampant racial profiling, fear, and erosion of individual rights in the absence of justice. The large number of arrests inside the United States over the past decade also has created an enormous backlog in the immigration courts. Many individuals with viable cases must wait years to see a judge. Let me move on to the mandatory detention scenario. And I want to tell you about a case of a woman that to this day breaks my heart. Um, the good news is today we decided to file a petition to the U.S. Supreme Court asking for the court to review it. It's a case of Gabriella who came to the United States with her family as an infant. She became a lawful permanent resident, married, and had four children. In 2004, she pleaded guilty to a minor drug possession charge and was sentenced to probation. 
She was subsequently arrested by the Department of Homeland Security. While she was locked up in a county jail, separated from her family, scared and depressed, a U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement officer told her it was futile to challenge her deportation and encouraged her to sign a stipulated removal order. Unaware that she had a meritorious defense to her removal, Gabriella signed away significant rights, including her right to a hearing before an immigration judge and her right to appeal any order of removal. Soon thereafter, the government deported her. She later returned to the United States to be with her children and her husband. We were contacted by another attorney to see if there was anything we could do. We reviewed her case and realized that she had a defense to that original deportation. What happened to her was not a deportable offense. She was a lawful permanent resident. But by signing that stipulated removal order, she had waived her rights to contest the removal. We have been litigating this case, this case trying to get the court to reopen. To date, it has not happened. She's been deported again. But we're not giving up. The government made an error, and she should not be suffering for that. Is it fair to deport a person to a country she's never known? Is it fair for a law enforcement officer to cajole a person accused of a non-criminal offense into relinquishing her rights when we require police officers to read perpetrators of alleged violent crimes their constitutional rights, even if they're caught red-handed? Or when we release convicted murderers when it can be proved that police or prosecutors violated their due process rights? Is it fair to create the conditions that make this pressure possible? By locking a person up far from her family and immigration lawyers with limited phone access and no access to the information the government will use against her in court? Is it fair to separate a mother from her children or to force her children to live with her in a foreign country because of a minor drug possession? Is it proportional to the harm done? Is this what the president means when he claims that the administration only deports criminals? It just doesn't make sense. Gabrielle's case is not unique. The United States detains more than 400,000 immigrants and refugees a year most of them in remote jails, in local county jails, and state prisons, at an average cost of $164 a night, or $2 billion annually. Most of these facilities are far from the urban centers where immigration lawyers, social service providers, and immigrant community groups typically reside. Combined with the fact that the government provides extremely limited information about or access to immigrant detainees, the remoteness of these facilities makes it extremely difficult for individuals to mount an effective defense, regardless of the merits of their case. In fact, 84% of immigrants in detention do not have legal representation. Phone calls are exorbitantly expensive. They average $5 a minute, and they're insufficient Know Your Rights presentations. While you and I live in a world of unlimited calls, texting, and data for $50 to $75 a month, these families cannot even communicate with their loved ones. Let me share another example, which has a happy ending, I'm here to say. While searching for an individual, the Department of Homeland Security entered the home of Jordana Vera, a 22-year-old Argentinian woman who would qualify for relief under the DREAM Act. After inquiring about her immigration status, the Department of Homeland Security detained Jordana because agents assumed that she had entered the United States under what's called the Visa Waiver Pilot Program. If one enters under the Visa Waiver Pilot Program, that individual has waived his or her right to a hearing. We have long argued that the Visa Waiver Program undermines, undermines fundamental due process protections. We intervened on her behalf. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit 
initially deferred to the government's decision to deport Giordana and agreed that she must have waived her, waived her rights despite a lack of any evidence that she came in through this program. We sought a rehearing of the decision and enlisted support from organizers and congressional offices in challenging her detention. When our advocacy campaign reached enough of the right people in effective enough ways, the government released Jordana from detention, admitting that a review of existing information, her file, showed that she had not entered on the visa waiver pilot program. The government canceled the removal order and asked the Court of Appeals to vacate the decision. Jordana has since been granted deferred action for childhood revivals, and she now lives happily with her family. However, she will never forget the nine months of detention in a county jail, with many of those months held in solitary confinement because she fought being deported. Is this justice? Is it fair for the government to check the citizenship status of individuals in private residences without a warrant to search that individual or any probable cause that they have committed a crime? Is it fair or transparent to deny a person the right to a hearing that will determine if she is banished from the only country she's ever known because it was in the fine print of a visa she obtained automatically at an airport? Is it fair to make a person not even accused of a crime to wear a prisoner's jumpsuit, live with absolutely no privacy, speak with their lawyers and family only by phone or through plexiglass, and remain locked up like a common criminal for nine months? Were the enormous resources expended to detain her and fight her case in the courts justified? Is it reasonable for the government to release her but leave the policy that led to her detention and prosecution unchanged? Is a temporary discretionary waiver that the government can revoke at any time without explanation really the best way we can do for young people who've known no other home than the United States? It just doesn't make sense. Once again, Jordana's case is not unique. The detention of asylum seekers and immigrants in removal proceedings is mandatory, and there's increasingly little room for the use of good judgment or discretion in determining who is detained, the duration, and under what conditions. Did you know that there is a detention bed quota in the immigration system? Push for by for-profit correctional corporations and members of Congress Congressional appropriations language requires the Department of Homeland Security to maintain 34,000 detention beds. This has been interpreted as needing to fill those beds. The pressure to maintain this quota deters officers from considering circumstances and if detention is necessary and appropriate on a case-by-case -case basis. There is evidence that bond determinations at the border fluctuate based on the population at any given time. This bed quota undermines other efforts to reduce the use of detention and increase use of alternatives to detention, which costs as little as 70 cents to $17 a day, a fraction of the $164 DHS spends to detain one person per day. There is no other law enforcement agency in this country that is required to fill detention beds. The bed quota has come under media scrutiny in the past years, and members of Congress are beginning to organize to remove the quota from the fiscal year Department of Homeland Security appropriations bill. 
To protect young people and other vulnerable detainees, such as gay and transgender individuals or those suffering from mental illnesses, the government often places them in solitary confinement, also known as segregation or protective custody. Through Freedom of Information Act requests, we obtain data regarding the human rights violations occurring to detained immigrants subject to solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is a form of segregation in which individuals are held in total or near total isolation. Individuals in solitary confinement are generally held in small cells for 23 hours a day and rarely have contact with other people. In all instances, individuals in solitary are subject to stringent restrictions on recreation, visitation, and other privileges available to other members of the population. As a result of the data in our own clients' experiences, Jordana, as I mentioned earlier, we release a report, Invisible in Isolation, the Use of Segregation and Solitary Confinement in Immigration Detention, where we documented that the use of solitary confinement of immigrants in detention is often arbitrarily applied, inadequately monitored, harmful to the health of the individual, and a violation of their due process rights. After the release of this report, the New York Times covered a story on the front page in March of 2013 and reported that 300 immigrants daily are held in solitary confinement. This story led to a lot of action within our government. And the Department of Homeland Security issued a policy known as the Segregation Directive to provide more oversight on the use of solitary confinement. The directive requires all detention facilities which contract with Immigration Customs Enforcement to report cases in which individuals are held in solitary confinement within a certain time period. In addition, the directive includes special reporting requirements for vulnerable populations, including people with mental illness, severe medical, medical illnesses or disabilities, pregnant or nursing women, elderly individuals, and those susceptible to harm due to their sexual orientation, gender identity, or because they have been, been victims of sexual assault. However, the directive falls short because it does not eliminate the use of extended solitary confinement and does not allow for independent third-party oversight. Let me focus now on the last third category, recognizing humanitarian groups. And I'd like to tell you a story about Yesenia. At the age of 14, Yesenia, a lesbian from El Salvador, was forced to marry a man 50 years her senior to cure her homosexuality. Her husband raped her on numerous occasions. At one point, he even drugged her so that, he could, so that she would submit more readily. Simultaneously, several women in her hometown beat her for being a lesbian, left her unconscious by the side of the road. She fled to the United States for protection. When she arrived at the border and told her story, Customs and Border Patrol refused to recognize the harm she suffered and her right to seek protection. She did not have an attorney, and instead of allowing her to see a judge to evaluate her claim, the Border Patrol officer issued an expedited removal order and deported her to El Salvador. Because she could not live safely in El Salvador and her life continued to be in danger, she came back to the United States a second time. Once again, she explained that she was afraid to return to her home country. And this time, the officials believed her and sent her before an immigration judge. The officers told her that because of her prior deportation, remember I talked about those reinstatements? This is a reinstatement case. She could not apply for asylum, but could only apply for another form of protection, which requires a higher standard of proof and does not allow her to seek permanent status. Not only was she denied a right to seek asylum based on the government's initial error, but the judge denied her protection and ordered her deported. 
While detained, Yesenia happened upon information about an asylum documentation project NIJC had undertaken by pure coincidence. She contacted us and we represented her in her appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. We successfully argued that Yesenia should be entitled to seek asylum despite the prior removal order. To avoid the court possibly issuing a presidential decision, the Department of Homeland Security agreed to rescind Yesenia's prior removal order and gave her a new hearing and she will now be permitted to seek asylum on the basis of her forced marriage and other past harm. Is this justice? Yes, or at least a measure of it, right? The problem is, is that we know that many refugees like Yesenia don't get a second chance to make their cases. They don't have access to a lawyer, much less a team of pro bono lawyers. And their cases never make it in front of an immigration judge much less an esteemed panel of federal circuit court judges. Yesenia's case is not unique. The same issues I discussed above, aggressive enforcement that prioritizes deportation over adjudication and the use of mandatory detention have made it incredibly difficult for individuals who flee persecution to get access to counsel and a fair hearing. If we continue to direct our immigration enforcement to treat all non-citizens as potential threats to be removed as expeditiously as possible, and we re continue to require harsh and punitive detention for all asylum seekers, other Yesenias will continue to fall through the cracks, and the United States will fail to live up to its obligation under the Refugee Act. Our reputation as a symbol of justice around the world will be diminished. We are continuing to litigate this issue before the federal courts to help other Yesenias in the world to make good law to ensure that refugees are not barred from seeking asylum because they were wrongly deported initially. You'll hear a lot of talk about fraud in the asylum system and the backlog it has supposedly created. Like any legal claim, there are certainly bogus cases and in individuals who try to game the system. But the vast majority of these cases don't go anywhere. In fact, the majority of asylum claims filed in the United States are abandoned or withdrawn. Why? Because they're extremely difficult cases to win. In order to sustain an asylum claim in the United States, an individual has to prove that she faces a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. They have to show not just, not just that this kind of persecution happens in their country of origin, but that they have been specifically targeted for persecution based on one of those five grounds. This involves submitting pages and pages of background information, sworn affidavits from witnesses, and getting a favorable credibility finding from an asylum officer or an immigration judge, and passing a forensic examination of any official documents contained in the file. As for the backlog, it is not the product of a handful of overzealous activists filing bogus claims to make a political statement or some invalid claims filed by unscrupulous attorneys and notaries. The real backlog is the product of hundreds of thousands of cases like that of Juan Carlos or Poppy or Maria or Jordana. Ordinary people who've lived most of their lives in the United States, who face detention and deportation for no crimes or relatively minor crimes on which the government spends vast amount of money, time, and human resources. That's the real backlog and it has very little to do with justice. Let me share one final example with you. Adrian is a 17-year-old Honduran boy who is a devout Christian. The street gang that controls his village targeted him for recruitment 
because they believe he could enter the territory of rival gangs without any suspicion if he worked for the gang. He refused to join, telling them it was against his beliefs. When he tried to flee, they shot him in the back. Adrian survived, but knew he could not remain in Honduras. He fled to the United States and was detained by the Border Patrol and placed in removal proceedings. He was released to the custody of his uncle, who lives in southern Indiana, where there are no legal service providers. NIGC has struggled to prepare his asylum case and anticipates additional challenges as proceedings continue since Adrian cannot travel and has only very limited telephone access. Is this justice? Time will tell, but it hardly seems fair to place children in removal proceedings without access to counsel or any special accommodations for the fact that they are children to say nothing of the persecution that children like a Adrian allege. And if Adrian were Mexican, he likely, would not have been he likely would have been turned away at the border without any screening to find out if he was fleeing persecution, human trafficking, or trying to reunite with his parents. In what other situation would we find it acceptable for law enforcement to turn away or lock up an unaccompanied child without finding out why he or she wasn't with her parents or in need of protection. Adrian's case is not unique. This year, a projected 60,000 unaccompanied children will arrive in the United States, a number that has ballooned from a long-term long average of 5,000 per year. Most are from Mexico and Central America, a significant proportion of these children are fleeing violence in their home countries, some for organized crime, others from street gangs, and some from their only own families. Many have been abused, neglected, or abandoned by their parents, and most are exploited and abused en route to the United States. The conditions in their home countries, the perils of transit, and their vulnerability in the United States are well documented. Very few of these kids will apply for asylum or other forms of protection that you, under US law. They are scared, confused, and under extreme pressure to get out of detention as quickly as possible, even if it means waiving the rights they never knew they had. They have very limited access to counsel or appropriate social services, and the burden of proof and other legal standards are seldom adjusted to account for the fact that they are after all, children. The Mexican kids are mostly turned away at the border, and the deporta deportation ki cases of Central American kids will grind through the overloaded court system for years to come. There is a silver lining, however. Almost everyone involved with these cases, from the Border Patrol and the Office of Refugee Resettlement, to immigration lawyers and child advocates, to diplomats and federal prosecutors, Almost everyone who has a stake in these cases has recognized that something isn't right here, that justice isn't being served. There's an earnest desire to find a more just and humane way of addressing this crisis and the goodwill to discuss our options with open minds. Tomorrow, in fact, the Transborder Institute and the Casa Cornelia Law Center will host an urgent action roundtable with law enforcement, lawyers, and child advocates to discuss and design ways to better screen children at risk. Tomorrow's meeting will be private to facilitate dialogue and build trust among stakeholders. But on June 13th, there's another opportunity. The Transborder Institute will host a public conference with experts and practitioners from across the country to place the current wave of unaccompanied immigrant children into broader context and to develop humane and effective alternatives. I hope you will join them. These are critical but small efforts. If you don't give your time, your voice, and your vote to these issues, real change won't happen and justice won't be done. I realize that I have identified more challenges than successes in my remarks tonight, and that the case histories can be heavy and tragic. 
but I hope you'll see a way forward here too. Social change is often generational. It is something that takes a new outlook and new energy, not just new ideas. In fact, we've seen this in the immigration field. It is the immigrant youth who have been courageous enough to come out as undocumented and force university presidents, state legislators, even the President of the United States to see them as human beings, to stop denying them the future they deserve, to allow them to live without fear and pursue their dreams. The challenge for you as the next generation is how will you make your mark in the world? How will you make the world more just? You have that opportunity and we are all counting on you to take advantage of it. The successes we have achieved, the justice that we have seen done has not come by radical rethinking or grand policy designs, but by a return to basic ideals of due process, equality before the law, and the proportional use of power. By ensuring these core constitutional protections for all non-citizens, regardless of their immigration status, we empower individuals to tell their own stories, to let their own humble eloquence carry the day. And that, my friends, is justice. Thank you. So now we have some students here. We'd like to open it up for questions. Um, but we have, some, we have folks with some cards and pencils. So if you'd like to ask a question, just put your hand up. We've got kind of a large group, and we, we, we'd like you to write down a kind of basic question, and, and the students will collect them. And then uh, we'll, we'll sort through them and take questions here for a second. Okay, well, while, while the collections, uh, the uh, questions pile up here, and before we go through them, let me just th let me just throw a question to you. you. You talked a lot about the got us kind of into the details of this, and you and I can get into the weeds of the immigration law in these case all day. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know you do a lot of training of young lawyers, and you bring a lot of people who are in your profession, um, you know, into this world. What do you think? What, what do you think brings them? Or what, what do you think? What do you think they get out of it? What would you? You know, we got a group of students out here, and they're considering a career in the law. And if they go to law schools, including this one, but any good law school, you go and you look at the course catalog, and there might be one course on immigration, and that's it. And many law schools don't even have a professor a professor of immigration law, so it falls to people like you to teach them. What do you? What's your message to them? How do, you, how do you encourage people to, to get involved in that? I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's one of the most rewarding experiences in your legal career. And we've heard that from major partners of law firms, Baker McKinsey, Sidley Austin, um, that you know, these lawyers come out of the representation in the courtroom uh, out of the courtroom from representing one of our clients and they're like, I am so glad I'm a lawyer because this is what it's all about. And it's not only using your intelligence and your um, commitment and perseverance as an advocate, but it's empathy, it's feeling what's going on with that individual. And um, you know, some of our pro bono attorneys have commented to me, like, 
none of my clients give me a hug at the end of a trial, but my asylum seeker case just gave me this big hug. Um, so I do think it's just one of those um, opportunities as a lawyer, um, or in any profession, there are opportunities to connect with people and work for social change. And um, you can do it with the individuals, or you can do it on a more systemic level. But um, you know, with these young people, I mentioned in my remarks, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, these are children between, uh, young immigrants between ages of 15 and 30 who have been undocumented. Some of them didn't even know they were undocumented. Um, and they came forward and we had these clinics and we had, we worked with the legal counsel, legal departments of various corporations. And one man came out after, the lawyer came out afterwards and said to me, he said, you know, these kids, they're smarter than my kids. He was the National Honor Society. He, you know, was tutoring. He was the coach of his tennis team. Uh, it's amazing what this young person has done with, with very little. So I think it's that connection with the human being. It's that connection with our society to say we can make it better. And for lawyers, um, as I experience, it can become pretty tedious. So these are really great opportunities. You know, I, I mean, I've heard that from some of your volunteer lawyers too. We, it's, I think it's important to point out that a lot of them have barely been to court. Yeah. And one, one of the things they get out of the immigration system is they realize that there are very few layers to this. It's you and the judge, and we get um, you know, really good tax attorneys and corporation counsel, and they realize that they're actually gonna have to argue in front of a judge. So we have a, as the questions come in here, I see we've got, um, I, I see sort of three genres of questions. Okay, so let me, and I'll probably get more, let's see. But let me ask the first one here. The first one is, lots of people want to know, do you think immigration reform is possible and do you think Congress and the President are gonna do it? Boy, uh, I wish I had the answer to that. Um, I, think, I think there is a possibility. I think it's going to be, um, it, there's going to be a very short window of opportunity for that, and that's probably going to be um, in July. I think we have to get through the primaries and some of that politics, and then it's a matter of whether or not um, the House will take this up um, as an issue. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense politically, economically, and, and obviously morally, but um, who who knows? But I think there's an opportunity. I think there's a chance. If we don't do it now, I'm not real encouraged about what's possible in the future because I think it's just going to be a lot harder. And, uh, so another set of the questions here, and these are very good, by the way. We have a lot. Um, but let me, another set of these seem to be about the, the, um, the underlying conditions that send so many people here. A couple of questions about economics, about wage gap, about poverty abroad. How do you see that as a practitioner? I mean, of course, when we work on these cases, we, we work on the, the kind of very specific case by case, but how, how does that inform how you think about the broader issues, the, 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 the wealth gap between our two countries or between our country and other places around the world and global poverty and some of the other forces that send people here? I mean, I always thought, yeah, as an organization, when I first started that, I really wanted to go address those root causes, that I wanted our attorneys, our pro bono attorneys, to really like, look at what's causing people to flee their home countries. Because our clients, especially you know, when I'm talking about asylum seekers and those fleeing persecution or abuse or victims of human trafficking, they're caught up in that because of an economic reality in their home country. and and and. How do we begin to address that? And I think, I mean, at one point, as I said, I thought that would be where we would go um, vision-wise, but there were so many issues domestically that we didn't go internationally, and other parts of Heartland Alliance have worked on international issues. But um, I, I think it's a reality, and, and Mary Robinson, who is a former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and even former President of Ireland, always said, you know, it, it, the crisis, if we don't fix people's um, 
economic situation, we're not even going to have human rights in our world today. So it really becomes an economic issue. And how do we make sure that everyone has um, the ability to live a dignified life? And um, I've had clients, Ev knows one of them in particular, who have gone back to their home country once it was a little bit safer, safer because they wanted to contribute um, to make their country more stable, more economically viable, and a, a place where they could live, their families could live. So I, I, I do think that's an issue for all of us in this work, but um, I think we have to figure out what our place is in, in, in this global human rights community. Terrific. Well, I have a lot of, a lot of these are very specific, but I have a, I have, I've seen four questions here that ask about why not just work visas? In other words, why, when we talk about immigration reform, are we ta do we foreground citizenship? And we have some people who are political moderates, people like Jeff, Jeb Bush, who have suggested, why not start with work visas? Well, the prob I mean, I think the biggest problem is you have 11 million undocumented people here in this country. And um, you can't say, here, I'll give you a this little you know, path to this point, and then it stops, because they never are able to enjoy basic fundamental rights as US citizens, which you know, they have made invaluable contributions to our, our community, our, our country. And I just think it's an issue of fairness and equality, and to say, here, we'll just give you this much and continue to use your labor and your your skills to contribute and strengthen our society without giving them the whole panoply of, of legal rights. So maybe that doesn't come right away, but I think a path to citizenship is really important. And then I think with just work visas, I mean, that may be coming down the line for future flows, and I think you need to have all those human rights protections um, uh, corresponding to any type of work mm -hmm. visas. But, for the 11 million people who have lived here for years, I think the statistics say, say most people have been here for 10 years, um, to not give them a path to some type of citizenship, is, I think is just wrong and not fair. You, you know, to me, I think you, you answered it with the case histories. You know, a lot of the cases and the case histories, we have people who are legal permanent residents or have some kind of visa. And, and the answer is that in, in our system anyway, at least the way we understand it now, if you don't have citizenship, you don't have a you, you know, you're, you're not a, you're not a, yeah, right, you don't have the full protection of the law. Um, so let's see, there's a couple of things that are kind of more about the practice of the law. So let me ask you, um, let me ask you one, let's, let's, I know you, in your talk you kind of addressed the, um, the, uh, the question of fraud, but what about in the practice of immigration law? I mean, we know that um, there are some unscrupulous practitioners out there, the people who give bad advice. Um, there's this problem of unauthorized practice of immigration law. Uh, I know you've been part of a big um, class action lawsuit against notarios, um, community lawyers, and um, but tell us, just tell us a little bit about that. We've had some legal change in California on this issue. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there are some excellent immigration lawyers um, and I think it's a very complex area of the law so that um, you know I, I would really encourage young people who are interested in the practice of immigration law to work with some more senior immigration lawyers um, but I do think the reality is is that there is a lot of exploitation that occurs in the community and that people are really being taken advantage of by um, sometimes, unfortunately, legal professionals, lawyers, um, but also primarily we see it with notarios and individuals who see an opportunity to take advantage of uh, an individual who's desperate, desperate for help. Um, so I, it, it's complicated, and I, I'm on the a American Bar Association's Immigration Commission, and we've really been trying to promote access to quality legal representation and, and encourage immigration lawyers to know what, what, they, what, what they can do and what they can't do, and, and to be honest with clients. And, and that goes for fees also. 
Great. Well, let's. I think I have a couple, just a couple more questions, and I'm, I'm sorry I won't get to all these here. I'm trying to um, summarize them a little bit, but there are a couple of questions in here that uh, point to I think a really a really important issue. Um, and again, the the audience has done a great job. So, how do we deal with the violence and vitriol um, that sometimes, in fact, pretty much every day happens in our immigration debate? Um, and 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 you know, there there are things that people say that. You know they go they go far beyond uncivil discourse, but even some of the, just the general tone of the discussion of the issue it gets really hateful really fast. Um, how would you say you've dealt with that in your experience in your career? I mean, I I think it goes back to what I was saying in my my life journey is it's the experiential, so that when an individual meets one of my clients or has an immigrant or asylum seeker as their client, it totally changes their perspective. So going back to you know the corporate counsel who's representing one of the immigrant youth obtaining DACA, he walked out and he said, oh, this kid, you know, who I bet yesterday he may have been talking back about this kid being a gangbanger because he's, you know, a certain color. He now recognizes this kid is like his own son, and probably, in this case, he thought he was even excelling a little bit better than his own son in school. <laughs> but um, I think it's that one-on-one -on -one experience. Now, that's really hard to have when you're talking about being on the floor of Congress and having this highly emotional debate, right? So where do you go with that? And I think in those cases, what we've done is, is kind of moved off of talking about it from a human rights perspective, but more to an economic perspective. Like, is this worth the money we're spending? I mean, the amount of money we're putting into this immigration, $2 billion a year to detain and detain people. It's just detaining people. It's ridiculous when we have such a crisis economically. So, um, you know, trying to move the debate to say, what are, what are we afraid of here? And is there a better way to respond to the immigration debate other than pouring more money in enforcement and, and detention? So a couple, there are a couple of questions in here about the dreamers. And um, uh, what, el what else can we do? So we've got deferred action, but what about kids who've been detained for long periods of time and had their education interrupted? Um, or what about kids, you know, I'd add to that, who it's happened to a brother or sister and it's totally disrupted their household, something we see every day. Um, you know, given that they've kind of captured the, the hearts and minds of a lot of people, they, for some reason, we, you know, for, well, for lots of good reasons, um, they've really been a lodestar. They've attracted a lot of attention, and it, it seems like people are more sympathetic to them than they are to others. Are there other things that we can do other than comprehensive immigration reform that we can and should do for the dreamers? Well, I mean, I think it remains to be seen what happens with Congress, but if, if we don't see any movement in Congress, then I think we need to look at what the administration can do in terms of um, expanding this deferred action um, not only for immigrant youth, but um, you know, I, I argued in a um, policy brief that we sent to the White House that you know take off the the cap of having to be 31 years of age or under 31 years of age, so that it's expanded for people over 31 years of age. So I think expanding DACA it would make a lot of sense for the administration. And then I think we just need to look at the enforcement that's happening right now and, and really um, hold the administration accountable for mm. what type of enforcement is occurring. I mean, is there a reason to have deported Poppy? <laughs> you know, like, was he a risk? Was he a danger? That's a case where they could have exercised deferred action. Um, Gabriella, you know, a mistake was made. We have been, we've litigated that case in the Fifth Circuit and the Seventh Circuit, and as I said, we decided today we're going to the Supreme Court. But, you know, that's a case where someone made a mistake, and we all make mistakes, but why couldn't we have just given her a chance? And the immigration um, system has that authority and power, but instead she's separated from her children. 
I, there are a couple of questions in here about um, the reports about abuses or, or the misuse of force by the Border Patrol. Um, this is obviously something that it, it's kind of a developing story. In fact, on May 30th, here I'll give us a nice plug, We're gonna, the Border Patrol is actually going to come here and do a, a press conference open to the public. Uh, on a, it's a Friday at 8.30 to talk about the issue. But could you just tell us a little bit about um, you know, how, what, can you tell us your opinion of a lot of these reports we're getting about Border Patrol and about other um, immigration law enforcement seeming to play by a different set of rules? Well, and I have probably colleagues in this room who know a lot more about Border Patrol than I do, given that I'm right in the middle of the country. But um, my sense is, um, is twofold. One is, it is an agency that has grown dramatically, quickly. I mean, um, you know, when all of a sudden you're adding all these new employees or people, you don't have the time to train them and you don't have the experienced supervisor to oversee them. So I think part of what's happening with the Border Patrol right now is um, just lack of training and monitoring and oversight, um, number one. The other thing I think that happens, and I see this uh, in bureaucracies, in the government, is that the measurement of performance, um, it, 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 it's not, it, it, the, the way individuals in the government are, are determined to be a good or bad employee is not based on um, issues of justice and fairness and treating people humanely. So that, you know, I would even say, you know, border patrol should be measured by how many people they've helped to, you know, secure and look at their cases and screen to make sure that either they are eligible for relief or they're not eligible for relief, but that the measurement should be something positive as opposed to how many people did you get deported. So it's a culture shift that I think we need. So what, yeah. what incentivizes an individual to be a good employee? Um, and when you're talking about a government agency, a bureaucracy like the Department of Homeland Security, I think you have to be really careful and look at that and say it's not about trying to deport thousands of people, but it's rather doing a really good comprehensive job of screening these cases or making sure you're treating people humanely and that we don't have complaints regarding poor treatment. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, I'll tell you an anecdote from being in your office. I, I, right after the Homeland Security Act passed, um, I, I don't know if you remember this. We were on, you were on a speakerphone with um, a, a woman at Health and Human Services who had been a, she was a, had been a, an officer at the Immigration Naturalization Service, the, you know, the former INS, but she was a service person. She saw her job as, you know, helping people to become Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and she had this big accent, and she just, I just remember her yelling across the phone, Mary Big! They told me I'm supposed to stop terrorists. She said, I don't know nothing about stopping terrorists. She said, and she said, she said, I help old ladies become Americans. I, I help people learn who the presidents are. I make sure their papers are in order. You know, and, and, and it was just, and I'm, I'm not, I don't say that to mock her. I say it was, it was just genuine. You know, it's this, this idea that there was, you know, a big part of what it meant to, to enforce immigration law was creating new Americans. It was about citizenship. It wasn't just about, um, about, about deporting people, and, and, and it didn't operate under this logic. I mean, when pe people often forget this is a recent change. Right. The Homeland Security asked, tasked every, um, everyone in the Department of Homeland Security, everyone in Immigration and Customs Enforcement, their number one job is to prevent terrorism, at least in, its, in the black letter of the law. And that means that their mandate is to treat everyone coming to the United States, every non-citizen, as a potential threat. And that, you know, if, you don't, if we don't get to that, I mean, I'm, I, I worry we're not going to get to the core of the problem. So um, let me, um, let, a bunch of the cards, there's another common theme that comes here, and it's a good way to close. Lots of people want to know how to get involved. <laughs> Is Elizabeth here? Or Casa Cornelia? Oh, yes. Okay, here she is. Casa Cornelia. I mean, I'm sure you're like us. We're always in need of volunteers, um, whether it's translators or pro bono attorneys or people who are willing to um, accompany people to their um, interviews or their hearings or, you know, their check ins. 
um, or to take care of their children. I mean, there's so many opportunities um, to volunteer with a legal service organization. I encourage you to write op-eds, to talk to your um, local members of Congress. Uh, California has a trust act that passed that um, limits cooperation by local law enforcement with uh, federal immigration authorities, which is great. Um, just encourage people to, to comply with that. And um, you know, the, this whole thing of the enforcement with the secure communities, it doesn't make us any more secure. In fact, it's created less security because people are afraid to come forward and be witnesses or to report a crime because they're afraid then they're in danger of being deported. So I think the more we can say both at the state level as well as the federal level, we need to do the right thing and immigration um, you know, affects all of us and as a community, we need to make our community safe and we can't have people being afraid to report a crime because they're afraid they're gonna be um, arrested and deported. So I think talking to local communities, talking to your congressmen, your senators to say, look, even if they already support it, to let them know you still support it and that they, you think this is important because they get a lot of anti-immigrant um, calls and letters. And so, you know, I'm from a state of Senator Durbin who you know, has been the leader of immigration reform and the DREAM Act for years. And I still call him, or when I see him, I say, keep fighting, keep fighting, don't stop, you know, because they need to know that we're still supportive of what they're doing. Well, with, with that, uh, I'd like to do two things. First, I'd like to invite you all to a reception out in the rotunda immediately afterwards. And second, and most important, I would like to thank Mary Meg McCarthy for joining us tonight and giving us a great talk.